Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you again. It's a triple threat Sunday, it's school holidays, long weekend, and daylight saving. So, well done on being here. To be honest, I'm quite surprised. I thought it was just going to be the worship team and me, um, and maybe Heather, although I think she's decided to go home now too. So, um, anyway, welcome, good to see you, and it's good to be back. Kinda. Um, I mean, you know, to be honest, um, you know, we did say to ourselves, we can't wait to get back to soggy Sydney um, and leave all this stunning weather, food, art, architecture in Spain and Italy. Um, yeah, we couldn't wait to get back here to the cold and the wet. So, yeah, it's, it's good to be back. Um, no, it is good to be back. It's, this is home um, until we can move over there. So, <laughs> anyway... Thank you to Mark and Brad and Gift, even though she's rigging the system and watching her own videos on 500 different devices uh, to, get her, um, to get her views up. We know, what, we know what's going on, Gift. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's got all these connections in Africa. It's not fair. Okay? It's good as... Anyway, thank you, guys. I, I didn't watch it live. Um, it was 2 a.m. where I was, and I, I'm committed, but I'm not that committed. Um, I was usually stumbling back from a nightclub or something. No, uh, no, that's not that's not true. Um, but I have caught up since. So thank you guys. It was it was great. It's great to. A, a friend of mine's been watching online, and he said, "Oh yeah, you get all these people to come in and speak while you're away." I said, "No, actually, they're they're people in church. You know, we've I've got quite a quite a deep bench of people here who can get up and and do a really great job. So we're really blessed here in this little church in Castle Hill." to have so many people who can get up and just bring the word like that. So thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate that. Okay, this morning I'm talking about how to wait well. Um, I'm not trying to jump on Mark's train here because I know he talked about waiting and watching as well. Uh, Any connection is purely coincidental. I was just reading over these parables of Jesus the other day and thought I'd really like to, to speak about this because... At first blush, these, these parables, they kind of, you know, sometimes when Jesus says things, they seem kind of disconnected. Um, he'll say one thing and then he'll say another thing and then he'll say another thing. And at, at first blush, you go, well, have you changed topic? Are we talking about something different? But, but they're, no, they're, they're actually connected and especially these three. And these three just have one very simple message to us, to the people he was talking to particularly, but by extension to us. And it's simply, simply you know, in life... Um, Sometimes you just got to wait. You just got to wait. Who likes waiting? No takers? <laughs> Who's good at waiting? Because I want to know your secret. That's right, it does, doesn't it? It depends what it's for. That's a big factor in there. You know, if you're waiting to go and see the headmaster, take your time. <laughs> yeah, you know? If you're waiting to get your lotto win, not that we play lotto, of course. Um, you know, can't come quick enough. I, I discovered that, well, not discovered, I had reinforced the fact that I'm not a good waiter uh, on these holidays. Um, I was responsible for a lot of the planning, a lot of the logistics of this holiday we, we just went on. And there were, there were not just Heather and myself, we went with our friends, there were four of us. So I did all the things like making sure we had all the flights to various places and trains and car hire all of that sort of thing. And I noticed every time we were in airports, and we were in quite a few airports this time, um, we'd, we'd get to our, our gate and, and those three would be sitting, talking, reading on their devices or whatever, and I would be standing, just staring at the screen <laughs> the entire time, somehow mentally willing the to be, thing to be on time and make sure I had the right gate or whatever. And I'd be standing there sometimes for an hour, They'd be sitting there just getting on with their life and I'd just be standing there staring at the board like this, somehow feeling like that was actually making a difference. And I don't know why it was a revelation to me that I'm bad at waiting because I do the same thing at home. If we have to be anywhere, I'm usually ready half an hour earlier than everyone else and I just stand awkwardly somewhere in the house, usually in the way of everyone and what they're trying to do. Like, I, could, I just go and I just, I just stand in the hallway, like this. Or in a doorway. And I'm psychically willing everyone to hurry up and get ready. I, it's not my fault, it's my army conditioning. You know, we used to have a thing in the army called hurry up and wait. 
right? And it was that they would always get us places super, super early so we could sit there for hours and do nothing. So I haven't outgrown that type of thing. Anyway, there's the mundane stuff we have to wait for in life, but then there's the big stuff that we have to wait for in life too, and that's where things can get really, really hard. And it's really hard because, because with that big stuff, it's almost always, we're always, almost always waiting on something we can't control, right? That's, that's why it's hard. We can't control. The, the results are completely out of our hand. We're waiting for that call from the doctor about those test results and we can't do anything about that. We're waiting to see if that job application has been successful and you know stuff's going on somewhere but there's nothing you can do about that. Or you're waiting for someone who said they're going to change to change. And again, you can't do anything about that because it's, it's down to them. Waiting can be hard. And it can make us second-guess ourselves and we can question our choices. Have I done the right thing? Was this the right direction to take? Was this the right decision to make? Maybe if I'd have done this instead because like, nothing seems to be materialising at the moment. And it creates all sort of anxiety and all sorts of scenarios in our heads, you know. What if? What if it doesn't work out? What if it doesn't happen the way or in the time? Or what if it's a no? What if it's bad news? What if it doesn't work out? Is it even going to get better? You know, all this stuff goes on in our minds. So, so here's what I want us to get this morning, right? Life is full of waiting. Life is full of waiting. The, the, the little things and the big things, it, it's never going to change. We're always going to have to be waiting at some point for some thing. So life is full of waiting. But what that's like for us is completely down to us, right? What that's like for us is completely down to us. There is a way to actually wait well. So in the context of these parables that we're about to look at, Jesus is speaking to a group of people who are, who are tired of waiting, right? They're just tired of waiting. They're people who have been formed on the basis that they were special and that they would have this great exemplary life and be a light and blessing to all other nations on earth. And life was going to be different for them because they were God's chosen people. But for huge parts of their story, that had not been the case and it was not the case right now in this situation. They had been conquered by one nation after another. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Assyrians, the Seleucid, the Greeks, the Egyptians, and now the Romans were making their life hell. And there'd never been a time since Solomon, in about the last 1,000 years, where they had not known themselves to be under some sort of oppressive military occupation by another power, and their life being anything but what it should be. And it was bad enough, but there was this expectation issue here as well, because as I said, they thought they were different and they were called to a different life. So there was this background story running the whole time. This isn't supposed to be the way our life is. This, is, this isn't meant to be the life we, we have. The, we're not supposed to be these people. We're supposed to be something completely different. And they would want to throw in the towel because things weren't changing and their prophets would pop up and they would say, no, don't give up. It's not going to be like this forever. You are destined for better things. God is going to come through and he's going to fulfill his promises to you. You'd wait. It's just, it's just around the corner. One day, one day God is actually going to fix everything. And in fact, that's a story their prophets would keep telling them over and over and over again every time the wheels would f fall off. Hang in there. Hang in there because one day, one day, one day all this waiting is going to come to an end and, and one day all the promises are going to come true. But you know, there's only so many times you can hear that story that never seems to eventuate before you start to doubt it, right? You know, it's coming, it's going to happen, it's on its way. We had this thing um, when I was in the army, I, I had to go up once to the Land Warfare Centre in Canungra to do some training. Imagine me, Land Warfare Centre, I was going to train to be a killer, right? And we had to go on this run, and the run was called Heartbreak Hill, and it's called Heartbreak Hill for a reason. It should have been called Heart Attack Hill, but it's called Heartbreak Hill. And it was called Heartbreak Hill, and we'd, we'd have to put on all our gear, our packs, our rifles, everything, and, and go on this run. And it's called Heartbreak Hill because every time you would round a bend and think, we must be at the top, there'd be more of a bend to go. And then you'd get round to that bend, and you'd go, aha, we've made it, but you were just at another bend. And it just went up and up and up. It was a bit like recently, Heather and I thought we were never, ever, ever going to get out of the forum in Rome. I'm not, I'm not joking. I am not joking. 
We followed every sign. You know, Ushita, exit. Okay, cool, we'll go this way. And it was like we'd gone into a parallel universe because there was no exit. And we would walk and then we'd find another sign. Oh, the exit's over here. And before long, we had started on the top of Palatine Hill. After an hour, we were on Palatine Hill. And I said to Heather, we're not going home. Like, some of you guys might go to the forum and go, is that Adrian and Heather camped out over... Are they living in the forum now? We were just never getting out. It was bizarre. Anyway, I digress. But this, this was kind of what it was like for these guys. They, they would hear the story and they would think, okay, then it's just around the corner. The answer is just around the corner. The deliverance is just around the corner. The promise is just around the corner. And they would get around the corner only to find disappointment. Like I say, you can only hear that so many times before you doubt it. And there's only so many times you can suffer that disappointment of crushed hopes and dreams and expectations and not get to the point where you start to disbelieve completely. Anyone know what I'm talking about? That stuff can happen really, really easily. And that's the danger of hope. You know, hope's a dangerous thing. That's the risk, that inherent risk in hope. And it's why we need to manage our own expectations of what we think God is promising us and the way in which we think God is going to deliver and why ultimately our hope has to be in the final outcome of all things and not necessarily in the immediate. Now, I know that sometimes can sound like a cop-out. And trust me, I know that God does come through in the immediate but not always, and not always in the time we want, and not always in the way we want. Which is why our hope has to be one that is fixed on the final outcome. You know, the early Christians used to have a thing about this, because they lived in a time when things were not working out the way they thought it was going to work out. A lot of them expected that Jesus was going to return and set the world to rights in their lifetime. You see this expectation, even in the writings of Paul. Paul was always talking about, hang in there, it's just around the corner, Jesus is coming back. Now, you see in his later writings that he realises that isn't the case, but there was this expectation and they had a saying, Maranatha, which was, come Lord Jesus, because they were living in a time and place where things were not going well for them at all and they wanted the promises now. And they would pray that and they never saw that. But that's why our hope has to be ultimately in the end. Now, we're just like these people that Jesus was talking to because we've all got our own versions of that one day story, that, that then, that, that when that kind of thing happens, you know, that time where it's all going to come together, that time where our plans will come to fruition, when our life finally works out the way we envisioned that it would work out, um, when those promises that we thought God told us or someone actually spoke over us, um, that's going to come true. You know, <laughs> I'm still waiting for one of those promises. Uh, we went to a conference many, many years ago and there was a guy with a prophetic gift there and it was, I believe he actually had a prophetic gift. He said some stuff that was incredibly true of people but I could tell he was a false prophet in the end because he came up to me and he said, Adrian, you're not known for this but you're going to be full of joy. I'll just leave that hanging there, right? I'll let you judge for yourself about whether or not. I am full of joy. Thank you, gift. I don't know how you define joy, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you. So we've all got our one-day story. Do you know that thing that we're still waiting for? So what do you tell yourself about these things? What do you do with that when, when you're still waiting for that one day to materialise? You know, maybe it's bigger than us. Maybe it's bigger than our little dreams and visions and whatever. Maybe we've got these, these bigger macro issues going on, like, like these early Christians did and like the people that Jesus was talking to, where we look at the world and everything that's going on in it and we think, when is God going to do something about this? I mean, seriously, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was resurrected and, and, you know, we've been wiping each other out in wars and, and, you know, famines and pandemics and there's injustice and cruelty and inequity and, and environmental disasters. Like, God, why don't you just step in and do something? You ever thought that? Like, where is God in all of this? Why doesn't he just step in and do something? And so it's to this group of people, like any of us, who have this kind of one-day story 
you know, one day God will, who are primed with expectation that Jesus tells this story. Not about God riding in on a big white horse and immediately fixing people's problems, but stories about wheat and, and weeds and seeds and yeast. I'm going to read it now and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's in Matthew chapter 13 and it starts in verse 24 and it says, Jesus told them another parable. And, and, and Matthew 23, like in going on 24 and 25, this is where Jesus starts to talk about how things are going to end up, how, where history is kind of going and, and how things are going to wind up. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good, fe- good seed in his field and while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, Because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He then told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He then told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked through all the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, so was fulfilled. What was spoken through the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. These guys are just like us. They, they, they're, they're coming to Jesus because they want to know when. When are things going to change? When are things going to get better? When are all the stories we've heard going to come true? When is God going to come through for us? When are we going to get to see that breakthrough we've been hoping for? And Jesus just tells them three stories that essentially are about well, you're just going to have to wait. The farmer, he watches and waits and watches with frustration as weeds are now growing up amongst the wheat that he's planted. The birds are watching the seed, waiting for it to become a tree so they can perch in it. And the woman is watching a pile of dough that she's put yeast in, waiting for that dough to work its way, uh, the yeast to work its way through all of that dough so that the bread will rise. Well, what sort of kingdom is that? That's not a kingdom where God rides in on a white horse and fixes everything the way we want, when we want. It's, it's a kingdom that moves slowly and secretly, sometimes completely unnoticeably, but ultimately grows, ultimately comes to fruition. But it does so in, in seemingly indiscernible ways. The problem I have with this is I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. I'll be honest with you. I don't want to wait. That's my prayer to God. I don't want to wait. Wait. I don't want to. I'm impatient. I want answers. I want breakthrough. I want the promises. I want all of those things and I want them now. Because I don't know about you, God, but I've got a very limited timeline here. Right? I don't have eternity. I have X amount of years. We all do. So... Please? Okay? I want God to do what I want when I want. I want God working to my timetable. That's what I want. And that's now. You know who I relate most to in these stories? The servants in the first story. They saw the weeds and they went to the master and they said, do you want us to pull them up? Like, do you want us to to get things moving? Do you want us to get this to the point that it's meant to be? Because we can do that. Like, we can see the weeds. Do you, do you want us to get things going for you? And the master says no. I mean, Jesus, this is the thing about Jesus. He's talking to this group of people. Within that group of people, he's got a very specific group of people in mind. Because there, were, there was a movement. There were groups of people within the Jewish people who were actively zealots. They were were opposing the Romans and they were killing the Romans. In fact, one of Jesus' own disciples was a zealot. And these were the people that thought, we're not going to sit around and wait for the kingdom to come. (laughs) 
We're going to sit in our hands. We're going to make the kingdom come. We're going to get rid of the Romans. We're going to kill them. We're going to help things along. Who can relate to the servants in this story? I mean, who hasn't wanted to give God a helping hand from time to time? You know? I get it, God. You're almighty. You're all powerful. You've got your own timetable. But you know what? I'm busy. I've got other things to do. How about I get things going? I can see what needs to be done. We can identify the weeds, can't we? That's the thing. I'm just going to go and get this. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to go and do it. Why don't we just do it? And the master says, no. No, because when you do that, you may actually damage the wheat in the process. I've often wondered how much better things would have been or even how much quicker things might have had a better outcome if I hadn't been so helpful. Yeah? You ever wondered? You ever thought, how much better things might have actually been if I hadn't tried to help God along? I might think I can identify the weeds. I might think I know what needs to happen. I might think I can see how this needs to play out. But there's a bunch of stuff I don't know in all of that. And in my zeal and in my impatience, I can end up wrecking the thing I want to accomplish. Destroying the thing or, you know, sabotaging the thing I want to see happen. Because in my impatience... I'm wanting to give God a hand. You ever done that? Jesus says, don't go there. It's going to happen. There is coming a time when everything is going to be sorted out. It's just not going to happen in the time you want or the way you want. You may just make things worse. So you just need to wait. We're going to wait. There's no other option. But what it's like for us to wait, that's entirely down to us. So how do we wait well? Instead of being racked with anxiety, instead of standing there staring at the boards and mentally and psychically willing things to change or, or, or getting involved and making things worse, how do we, how do we wait well? well I, I've got a few things I want to finish with this morning. The first thing is we can, we can just get on with things, right? Waiting doesn't mean passivity. It doesn't mean sitting around just being completely passive about everything. I like what Brad was actually saying last week. I think it sums it up beautifully. We just need to do what we need to do and then we just need to leave the rest up to God. That's it. It really, that's it in a nutshell. I don't need to add anything to that. We, but we don't sit on our hands. We don't sit, pace around anxiously overthinking everything and gaming out all the scenarios. We, we just need to do the things that are right in front of us. Be faithful in the things that we need to be faithful in. Be obedient in the things that we need to be obedient in. Be faithful. Be present in that moment. Um, do the things that line up where we want to go you know be strategic about that by all means move in that direction but then remind ourselves we we can't produce the outcome we we just have to do the thing that we need to do and be faithful in that moment and leave the rest up to God the other thing we can do is we can enjoy the now you know I'm one of those people who genuinely cannot relax until everything is sorted until everything is sorted you know at home honestly Unless, you know, the dishes have been washed and and the kitchen's been cleaned and, you know, the carpet's been vacuumed and the beds have been made and, you know, the, um, you know, yeah, Harrison's, yeah, yeah, brother, (laughs) me and you, we need to go to whatever it is, Anonymous, and get some help because, (laughs) you know, some people can sit there with dirty dishes. I'm like, (laughs) it's like a metaphor for my life. I'm just like, I cannot sit in the mess. I hate mess. I've got to have everything neat and ordered and tidy around, which is unfortunate because my life is pretty much a mess. But but it's like I cannot sit in in the mess. But life is lived in the mess. It's lived between the planting and the harvest. And there are lots of weeds in there. One day it'll be sorted, but we have to live in the now. And right now, there are weeds amongst our wheat. The bad and the good are occupying the same space. Satisfaction and discontent, they stand side by side and joy and sorrow intertwine and peace and sorrow cohabitate and gain and loss, they sit at the same table. You know, if we're waiting for the day when when life is everything we think it should be, then you're waiting in vain and you're not going to enjoy the now that you have because no matter how much Wheat, good stuff you've got growing in your life, there will always be weeds in there somewhere. There will always be the tension of how the world actually is and how you want it to be. And we don't want to miss the good that is here now while we wait for the perfect that is yet to come. 
The other thing is we can focus on the wheat, not the weeds. Let's just reframe that last point. Now, no matter how many weeds there are growing in your life, there is also wheat, right? There is. It's there. It's in the middle of all that is not right right now. It's there for you to see. Sometimes our perspective is that our lives look like wheat fields with some wheat. That's great. But other times our life, our perspective is our life is a bunch of weeds that might occasionally have a bit of wheat in it. But Jesus is reminding us that wherever the wheat is, there is weeds. And conversely, wherever there are weeds, there is also wheat. And what you look for, you will see. Right? What you look for, you will see. What are you focused on? What are you focused on? You're focused on the problems, you're focused on everything that's wrong, everything that's not right, everything that needs fixing, everything that is not yet, rather than what actually is. You know, isn't there some old Christian song about count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done? You know, this is why Paul tells us to give thanks. This is why Paul tells us to, to, you know, think about that which is excellent and noble and praiseworthy. To think about those things. Because, you know, and, and it's a discipline to have to do that sometimes. It really is. But they're there. And what you focus on, you will actually see. Now, it's probably harder for some of us than others to do this. And I re- and realise that the weeds don't and shouldn't cancel out the weed. That bad things don't cancel out the good things. Now, you may have a way to go in whatever it is you're trying to achieve. But you know what? How about celebrating how far you've come? Yeah? Not the fact that you're not there yet. I'm just celebrating how far you've actually come. Things may still be up in the air at the moment, but take a moment to appreciate what is grounded and what you do have. That may be over, that thing may be over, that may be gone, but, but what's the new thing that's emerging now? It's not always easy, I, trust me, I know, but try not to let the less than good things in your life rob you of what is. Look for the good, the seeds of the kingdom. And finally, feed the wheat. You know, I relate so much to the servants in this story, says, as I believe, my MO is, is I, you know, I can bring about the reality I want by just working harder and just by doing a whole bunch of things. You know, if I eradicate all these problems and everything's going to be okay, but the problem is that is not true. The other thing about living a life that's, that's, that's about weed pulling, it's, it's, it's problem focused. And when you live a life that's problem focused, that is just exhausting and draining. It, it doesn't bring you joy, you know? It does not bring you joy, uh, Marie Kondo. It does not bring you joy. Um, <laughs> it just sucks the life out of you because, again, what you focus on, you will see. And there are lots of problems to see all the time. And who feels better when they focus on problems? Okay, so it's not living in denial. It's not saying problems don't exist. It's just, it's not living your life trying to eradicate them all because that's like whack-a-mole, you know? You, you, You hit one and another one pops up. So you hit that one, but another one's popped up. That's... That's what going through life, trying to to go, I can't rest until everything's the way it needs to be. It's never going to be the way it needs to be. There's always going to be something going on. We have to give our attention to the good things more often than the bad things. You know, I I had my lawn looking pristine last summer. Like, I was so proud. I used to go out there and just stare at it, (laughs) right? Be like... And Heather and I would pull up in the car and Heather would go... Gee, the lawn looks good. I know. I know. It, it, it does, doesn't it? It looks great. You know? What's that? We do have an interesting life. Um, we're like Humphrey B. Bear, aren't we? We live a very, very exciting life. And so, you know, we look at this lawn and we go, oh, it's, it's wonderful. Anyway, winter comes around and, and winter grass starts to appear in my pristine lawn. And I've got Sir Walter Buffalo, right? You know, just, just you know, a few guys that need to know. That's just what it is. And um, it's winter grass starts appearing. I'm like, oh, so I start pulling a bit out, and more and more of it starts appearing. I'm like, you know what? I can't, be, I can't be bothered doing this. We go away. We come back, and the lawn's terrible. There's winter grass everywhere. There's clover because our neighbours don't look after their lawn, and some of it's blown over onto. Our, I'm blaming them anyway, and. <laughs> Um, you know, it's like, oh, I'm like, oh my goodness me. So, and I thought, you know what, I could, I could go around here and try and pull up all these weeds and sort this out. I'm just going to do what I did last year. And I went to Bunnings and I got my Shirley's number 17 and I came home and I mowed the lawn, threw it all over it 
I didn't need to water it in because we live with perpetual watering system at the moment. So I just waited for the next storm to roll in. It watered it, watered it all in. The, the point is, rather than pull the weeds, I just fed the grass, right? Because feeding the grass will strangle out the weeds. Weeds only grow in crap soil, right? Weeds only grow where there's no grass. So I feed the grass. The more grass that comes, the less weeds. And, and it's that kind of principle that I'm talking about in our own life, you know. Don't pull up the weeds. Feed the grass. Focus on the good stuff. Invest in the good stuff. And before long, yeah, the weeds are there, but they won't, you won't be preoccupied with them. They won't be robbing your joy, okay? So focus on that stuff. What you feed will grow. And I'm talking to myself here. I really am. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm talking to myself here because... One of the first things I had to do when I, when I came back to Sydney was, was immediately go and get my bloods done because I have to see my oncologist on Wednesday. And I need to find out if my treatment has actually worked or is actually working. And, and let me tell you, like even though I was in some of these beautiful places, there were times where I sat there and some really dark thoughts entered my head. In fact, it got so dark on the way home that even Tim Burton rang and said, can I have some story ideas, right? It's, it, it, it was like, it was, it was dark up there. And I thought, you know, I can keep focusing on this. I can think like this until Wednesday and I'm sitting in that office and find, find out, you know. But that's just robbing me of, of joy. It's robbing me of life. It's robbing me of being present. I can't, and here's the thing, I've got to wait. And I can't do anything about this. The results are what the results are. That's it. The, the results are what the results are. I cannot change it by stressing about it and trying to change. It's not going to happen. So what can I do? How can I wait? Well, I can choose to focus on the things. I can choose on being present now. I don't know what my future holds. I don't know how much of it. I mean, you're voting for me to be here for five years. That could be wishful thinking, <laughs> right? I may not be around in five years. No, it's true. I have to face that reality. But the fact is, I'm here. And here I am now. And I've got to try and live in this moment. And I've got to try and be present and appreciate what I do have around me. Not worry about what's coming down the track. Because none of us know what's coming down the track, hey? I mean, you feel sorry for me. You could all be dead before me. I comfort myself with that thought all the time. I don't. Much. But you know what I mean? I could feed the darkness, and, and, and sometimes I do, and it gets really bleak. So choose to feed the good stuff, guys. Choose, just choose to feed. It's not living in denial. It's not. It's, it's going, I see you, dark thoughts. I see you, reality. I acknowledge the fact that you're there. I'm just not going to give you the headspace and the bandwidth now because, because you're taking away from the life that I actually have, and that's, that's all we need to do. But look, let me finish by saying this. The elephant in the room in this, with, with the people that Jesus was speaking to and to us in this moment is trust. I mean, really, waiting comes down to trust. That's what it comes down to. Do we trust that God is who he, said he says he is? And he says he doesn't lie. He says that he is faithful in all things at all times. Is, is that who he is? And that he will do what he said he will do. Yeah, you know what? We could look at the world and we can go, it looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket, right? It looks like it's getting worse. But God has said, one day, one day all of those weeds are going to be tied up in a bundle and thrown in the fire. And then it's only going to be the good stuff left. Do we believe that's going to happen? Do we believe that's going to happen? That is ultimately where our hope needs to be. We may not see everything we want or hope for in this life. That's just the way it is. And we need to accept that. But our hope isn't in that immediate stuff. It's in ultimately in the one day. The one day it will all be put to right. One day we will get everything we have believed in, everything we have hoped for and everything we have worked towards, everything we have held on to. One day we will get that. Do we trust that? And if we trust that, we can live faithfully in the meantime. Yes? Let's finish with communion.